Hey, Brittany here. And I'm Claire. And you're listening to Eco Curious, a podcast dedicated to bringing interesting, relevant, and local science to the masses. This podcast is created by the Petty Kodiak Watershed Alliance, a nonprofit environmental organization based in Moncton, New Brunswick. Thanks for coming in after a field day. I mean, it's a long day for you, but just to start, how long have you been working with the Fort Folly Habitat Recovery and what is your main role within the organization? Okay, I started working with uh, Fort Folly Habitat Recovery in the fall of 2009. I was doing uh, some vegetation monitoring and permanent sample plots on the reserve. Over the years, I've taken on more responsibilities. And by 2011, I was actually running the fishnet trap as, as the lead. I've been in that position since then. So you've been doing this for seven years then? Uh, I think this is actually the ninth season that the trap's been running, so it would be my eighth season running the trap, I guess. Awesome. I think think that's right. Can you walk Uh, us through a typical day at work for you? Is it... Well, our office is in Dorchester, so there's actually a certain amount of driving to get to the head of tide in Salisbury, but to go and sort of meet there, uh, sort of get coordinated and figure out the plan for the day, and then uh, we head out and drive up uh, to Salisbury and we'll check the trap and really there's a lot of uncertainty before you get there on uh, what your day is going to be like because if if there's a whole bunch of fish to sample it could be a very long day if there aren't then it probably won't be mm-hmm. now at the at the old site that happened fairly often that there was a lot of fish to sample but because we've taken on this new site that we're working at and it's a little bit higher mm-hmm. there aren't as many fish on, on a daily basis so it's this year is, is a slightly Slightly simpler year also, because there isn't the silt at the new site that there was at the old site. Right. Just anything you do takes less time. Working at the old site, uh, everything was time consuming. Just getting yeah. with the mud. And Having to things. wash the equipment? In well, no, just, of the silt? just slogging through the mud. Okay, and, right. uh, Calves of steel, really, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And the old site also was due to uh, was exposed to problems coming from both directions. Like you could have a storm that would bring uh, trees down stream. Okay. That still happens at our new site. But uh, you also could have trees brought upstream by a strong enough tide. In fact, there was uh, on more than one occasion I've had uh, like when you use our large trap in the, in the spring for the Gaspero. It's this massive construction with these big wings, and I would have. A storm that would take down those wings, we'd fix them, we'd fish it for one day, and then you'd have a big tide that would come in the exact opposite direction that would take down the wings oh, again, going the other direction. It, yeah. The, and then we, you guys have to go in and do the damage control. And yeah, we have to go, have, have to go and fix everything and right. uh, get it back fishing. Is yeah, it yeah. ever difficult to get the big trees? or? Uh, yeah, sometimes. So. The nice thing when you're in that kind of tide tidal situation is, is that often all you have to do is get the tree out of your gear. Mm. And the tide will take care of it. And it'll be gone. Right. It, you, you don't even know where it went, but it, it'll be gone <laughs> the next yeah. day. You just have to get it unentangled, right. and then and then it takes care of it. But sometimes you'll see the same, you'll recognize the tree, it'll be back a week later. <laughs> because, you know, it's just you moving back. That the same tree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's just moving back and forth with the tide. At that point, wow. are you fed up and just take the tree out yourself if it's coming back? Uh, has have, hasn't <laughs> happened that it was that bad. Oh, that okay. To do no. That. Well, that's good then. Yeah. And I don't know if we mentioned, but the old site and the new site, they're a one kilometer about, apart. About a kilometer yeah. apart. Yeah. Yeah. But the differences between that, like, yeah. wow. Yeah, the old, the old one uh, is, is, is just a short distance below the 112 bridge, and the new one's just a short distance above it. And it has to do siting conditions like, um, well, first of all, having a landowner that's willing to grant you easy access through that's right. that, that's a factor but uh, also just having the right sort of conditions at the site we're, we're quite lucky this year uh, we're just off of Highland Park in Salisbury and so we have access through Highland Park Salisbury uh, Parks and Leisure has been very generous with that oh, yeah. but that's we also nice. the landowner on the opposite bank uh, is someone who's been a friend of the project for some years and so oh, he's actually letting great. us store all of our uh, stuff that we're not using no on way. his bank because we don't want to have our junk all piled in the park no. either you know so it's we're, we're lucky we have friends on both sides at our current site that's awesome yeah when we do culvert assessments we bring all of our stuff but we don't have that much i imagine you'd have quite a load of equipment it up. depends when we had the picket trap set up to deal with the gas grow uh, there's a lot 
associated with that. Like I said, it's a fairly large structure. Yeah. Because, I mean, well, I think our biggest day we had over 5,000, well, about 5,000 gas per hour this, this year. Can you I'll, say that one more time? 5,000. About 5,000 gas per hour. Probably just shy oh, of 5,000 gas per hour. Wow. And today we had 21 fish. Yes. So that's, that's why we're not still using the picket trap. Sort of have to transition. There's a lot of complexity associated with the picket trap, and it's necessary when you're dealing early in the season with the gas bro. Okay. But you get to uh, July, and it's pretty quiet. Mm. Things are starting to pick up now. Like we started to actually see, in addition to the, to the young of the year striped bass that we caught this morning, yesterday we actually had some young of the year gas bro that are coming downstream that were. Sp- that are the result of the spawning gas bro that came up in uh, May and June. Okay. Like they, they came up, spawned, this is their offspring yeah, coming the back juveniles. downstream yeah, on, their, on their way out to sea. And when they run into a tide, sometimes they go back upstream and that's how we get them in our nets because we're only getting fish that are coming upstream. What do the gas bro look like? They're, they're, another name for them is, is river herring. Okay. So they're basically herring. All but right. but uh, they're an adramus herring, whereas herring, the actual species when people talk about herring is Can you give us the definition of an adramus for the listeners? Uh, an adramus is a <laughs> fish that it spawns in fresh water, but then it goes out to sea to live its life. And it because there's much better feed out there, it'll, it'll actually grow into quite a large fish. Mm-hmm. And then it comes back to fresh water to spawn again. Uh, now, we have what are called catadromous fish here as well, which oh. are eels, they do the opposite. Right. They, the uh, they, they live their entire life basically in the river, but when they're done, they uh, go out to the Sargasso Sea and mm-hmm. spawn there. Then basically their offspring come back up here, but it's not the exact same fish. Whereas like with Gaspro and salmon, you have well, anadromous fish, they, you'll have a, a population that's the same population within the river reproducing and they'll show fidelity to their river, they'll come back to their river of origin. Mm-hmm. Catadromous fish, because they're spawning out there, then they just drift on a current and the fish that we're getting, the eels that we're getting here, their ancestry would be all up and down the uh, oh, Atlantic seaboard. I find the life cycle yeah. of American eels so interesting how they travel such great distances to spawn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and the thing is, is uh, they only figured out where they spawned, like in the 1920s, and no oh, one has no one has actually seen them spawn. They no just, way. No, no, one no, one that. Has, no one has actually seen in them spawn. In the ocean. In the ocean. Yeah. It's just they've narrowed it down and figured out that's probably what's happening. Oh and and European eels spawn in basically the same place, but mm. then ride different currents back to Europe, whereas oh, okay. the American eels come up here. Wow. Well, the ocean's such a big world. We were talking about earlier how uh, when the whales go out. Oh, the exact yeah. migratory patterns of yeah. some whale species. Yeah, we're not sure of that yet either. Now, you've been all over the world from Australia to Finland, to Turks and Caicos, to Kenya. Why did you decide to stay in New Brunswick for the Fort Folly habitat recovery? Well, simple answer is I uh, I basically decided I wanted to come to New Brunswick and settle down. Like okay. I was tired of traveling around, and uh, I was attracted to New Brunswick by a lot of things. But the main thing was both the lifestyle and the culture that's associated with that. Uh, New Brunswick has a fairly dense rural population, mm-hmm. which means that you can have a lot of people to work with but uh, spread out over a large area. Compare that to working uh, in BC, mm-hmm. for example. BC obviously has many more people. They're concentrated in urban They're centers, and, the, and, then, yeah. and then there's just wide areas of wilderness, which is nice in between. Mm-hmm. But if you want to do projects, there's mm-hmm. not really populations mm-hmm. to work with. So that also attracted me to uh, New Brunswick. And I was also, I mean, attracted by the idea that as the nation's only bilingual province, I thought it would be interesting. Are to, you bilingual yourself? I'm not actually bilingual, oh, okay. but I thought as a goal, I thought it would be good to, yeah, this is the place to raise to my kids to be bilingual, yeah, and that right. would be the best place to do it. And I came here and got married, and I got married to an Acadian, so, I mean, my oh. son actually is bilingual. From his mother. From his That's mother. Great. Well, and he gets his English from me, though. Yes. Her English is fine, too. Yeah. I mean, but it's nice to have parents that will speak both languages yeah. <laughs> alongside in a pair. That's great. And that's, uh, in terms of why I'm with Fort Folly, actually, I, when I first came to New Brunswick, I, I settled just outside of Fredericton. But then I ended up in Moncton because mm-hmm. I met my wife and we got married and I came to live here. And then I just happened, fortunately, to uh, stumble across work with, with Fort Folly. 
And that was kind of funny. Originally, uh, I was just looking on Job Bank, and they had a position listed for someone to do forest inventory work. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, what exactly my, my, would forest inventory work? Well, be? Uh, my undergraduate is in forestry, right. and so uh, forest inventory work would be just like getting out measuring trees, figuring out the volume you've got there. It's what I would sort of describe sawdust forestry. My, my, my thought was it was some sort of uh, community economic development thing that they were doing. And so uh, I sent my resume and thought, well, that would be a good job. Could get some experience doing that kind of Related thing. Related to your education. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. necessarily really what I wanted to be doing long term. And then they get back to me and uh, say, oh, yeah, we'd, we'd love to have you. And uh, I go on their website. Only then do I look and see what all they're doing and going, oh, my God, this is exactly what I want to do. This is great. <laughs> out. And it wasn't sawdust Thanks. forestry that we were doing either. It was just doing more biological work in, in, in the forest to figure out what, what the status of the forest inventory was. Mm, so, neat. Yeah. That was How did you jump from the forest inventory project to the fish monitoring project? Mm -hmm. Well, the... Uh, Simple answer is that was actually a gradual process. Like in tw the summer of 2010 is when the gates first opened, and I wasn't part of the fish monitoring project when that happened. I okay. was I was doing other work with Fort Folly, in Fundy National Park and uh, on the Big Salmon River, and and also on reserve doing some trail work. But uh, after that first season, uh, the person who had been running the uh, trap didn't come back, and so uh, oh, okay. they offered me the opportunity to come and take it on. And I, I have a background as a fisheries field technician as well as a master's in restoration ecology, so it's a pretty good fit with me mm. fitting into the Petticodiac restoration awesome. project. Very complimentary. So that, that fit nicely, yeah. And so um, when did this monitoring begin? It uh, began, the gates opened in April 14th of 2010, and it began just a few weeks after in early, in early May. Okay. So there was cool. no monitoring before the gates? No, there was, well, before the gates were open, where the original fishnet trap site was, was underwater. It was actually the very head of the head pond. Okay. And the monitoring itself, two years of it was required by the uh, uh, EIA that was done for the, uh, for the gate opening project. Right. And so the, the original plan had just been to do two years of, of the required monitoring, and it was thought shortly after that that uh, the bridge would be getting built, and then there's a further two years of monitoring required after the bridge is mm -hmm. completed. Um, what happened was there was a change in government, things started to run longer, and there was not any decision to build the bridge, but uh, the province seemed to feel that it was getting good value for its money on the, uh, on the monitoring. And so the monitoring continued, though the project itself is kind of in a gray area in terms of what was happening with it. And then went on like that for, se for several years. And then uh, in December of 2016, there was a decision to go ahead and announce the bridge as a project that was underway. Mm -hmm. We're still actually in the in-between phase because required monitoring under the EIA doesn't even really begin until after the bridge is finished in 2020. Yeah. You know, this is just monitoring that the province is doing out of its own due diligence rather than out of any kind of illegal. And so, yeah. uh, what methods and equipment do you use to monitor the fish at the pedicure? We have two trap types that we operate. We use the picket trap that I was describing earlier that's this massive construction. And we uh, use that uh, in May and June, and that's to accommodate the Gasparo. That's because you can get thousands of Gaspro. Like the most Gaspro I've ever seen at the trap on a single day was over 9,000. So we're not um, worried about that population, the Gaspro population? Well, if you look at the results we've gotten, there has been a decline in oh, Gaspro oh. since the gates were open. And that's kind of a long story, but it's not entirely a surprising one. What happened about three years after uh, the gates were open, the numbers of Gaspro coming back declined significantly, the spawning gas broke coming back. And if you look at what happened about three years after the causeway was built in the first place, the commercial fishery for gas borough collapsed also. In both cases, what's going on there is that gas borough come back to spawn about three to four years after they themselves had been spawned at the age of three to four. What we saw was that once the fish that had been spawned after the gates were open were the adults coming back, there were fewer of them. Hmm. Now, I can come up with several theories as to why that is, but basically it looks like the river is out of equilibrium that makes life hard for young of the year Gaspro to make that transition out to sea, and so you've got fewer of them coming back. However, 
we do catch young of the year gas bro incidentally as i was describing earlier when the mm-hmm. tides push them back up into our nets mm-hmm. and the numbers have continued to increase every year now at first i thought that might be going on just because the strength of the tide was increasing and a stronger tide pushes more but gas is it the population itself growing i don't know that it's the population growing but it does suggest to me that even if there are fewer adults coming back to spawn there are enough adults coming back to spawn and the population itself is reasonably healthy. Last year we had more young of the year gas grow than ever before. How many? We, said a record. we had, we had a, over uh, 4,000 I think that we had caught over the course of the fall. Because mm-hmm. uh, remember it's only an incidental catch. Mm-hmm. The tides themselves hadn't continued to increase. Like our tides plateaued at about 2014, so the strength of the tide hadn't been increasing, but we still saw this increase in the number of young of the year gas grow. Okay. I mean, so I'm satisfied that the population itself is fairly is fairly stable. Interestingly, this year we actually broke that plateau for the strength of the tide. And oh, the did tide we? Set, the tide what is the tide at record. now? Well, I'm measuring it using a gauge at uh, a railroad bridge just below the old fishnet trap site. Oh. And f- the first year, in 2010, when the, uh, when the gates were opened, it peaked at about 1.8 meters above the base flow of the river. In 2014, it, uh, the biggest tide was 2.4 meters, so over half a meter higher. Sorry, 2.3 meters. This year it was 2.4 meters, so it's continuing to get slightly stronger. And that's what I think is going to happen when the... Uh, when you put the new channel under the bridge, yeah. that the tide is going to come up some more and continue to get even stronger. Really? Because currently you've got five gates going through the control structure, each about 10 meters wide, so 50 mm-hmm. meters of passage. Which would probably slow down the flow. Oh, it slows really down the flow. Late. It's got. If you think about it, they're like pipes because mm-hmm. they've actually got tops. So there's 50 meters of passage with a top on it. Whereas under the bridge, when they put the new channel in underneath that, it's going to be 160 meters wide with no top. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine you're going to get, it won't be necessarily as big a change as when they open the gates going from zero to... Hero. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But it's it's going to be that much more, which is one of the things that's exciting for us at our new site, since we're actually still seeing these young of the year fish. Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll be able to measure changes that, that are happening at that site in the future too. What we're hoping to get this year at the new site is a baseline so that when that two years of required monitoring happens after the uh, bridge is complete, right. we actually have something to compare it to. Because yeah. you'd asked earlier about a baseline at the old site and there wasn't any kind of a baseline because it was underwater part of the head pond. And it's made it difficult to do much with the data. I've yeah, uh, tried to publish to some it results. To, yeah. yeah, and that's one of the in the peer review process, it's one of the major criticisms I've is gotten that, back mm-hmm. is what exactly are you comparing this to? Yeah. It's like, uh, don't, don't really have all I have is year one to compare it to, <laughs> which is not really a pre-state, it's mm-hmm. just a, exactly. yeah. And would there be any way to estimate what the fish population was like before oh, yeah. construction? Oh yeah, yeah. There, there are ways to do that. It just becomes more complicated and is a little bit more tenuous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not, not scientifically accurate for a, a peer-reviewed journal. Well, no, you could probably do it in a way that you could make... I mean, it, I'm not saying it's impossible, and it's certainly it's a goal to do. It's just more, cha- more of a challenge. More of a challenge. Okay. The, the nice thing we've got, the, the paper in question that we're talking about there was with eels, and we have this nice increase with eels at the trap. Well, we also can point at our electrofishing data in freshwater regions above the trap, and you see the exact same increase in uh, number of eels there as well. Mm-hmm. So if you if you get enough evidence together, at some point everyone agrees, okay, that's mm-hmm. reasonable. Okay, that's it, accurate. It just, yeah. it just takes time, and, and that's the way it should be. Right. You don't want to make it too easy to make right. crazy claims. <laughs> I guess that would be... Now, yeah, what is exactly. your monitoring schedule like? You go out once a day, Monday to Friday? Yeah, we go out once a day, Monday to Friday, and we're like, this is a long weekend. Yeah. We won't be, uh, we won't be doing it on this, this coming Monday. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one of those things where in a more ideal world, you could say, oh, we should have every single day, but, you know, there is limited resources, and this is... We're, we're, Employees, yeah. Yeah, this, what, what we're doing with the resources available... Is, is the best. Is, yeah. is, is a good fit. Yeah. So how do you what? How did you pick what time of day to go monitor the fish? You go out every morning. Well, at the old site, we would have to work around the tide, and sometimes we'd be doing it before a coming tide, and that could be a bit of a challenge because so, we'd be racing to get done yeah. before the tide 
comes mm -hmm. in and hits you. So the tidal board twice a day, do you have to work around that? It's 12 hours apart, so generally we only have to worry about one tide. The question is, when is that tide coming? What would be preferable would be to let it come, let it go, be done, and then arrive after it at the site and do it. And that's what we would try and do yeah. most of the time. But there were times where it made more sense to try and go before it, and then you just had some if adrenaline. If the tide wasn't late afternoon, for example. Yeah. yeah, and then you just have some adrenaline trying to make sure that you were done before before it arrived. Because oh, when it got there, you time to go, <laughs> you're done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the new site, it's that's not an issue. The oh. tide does arrive at the new site. I've actually seen evidence of, of a tide line, like the Maple Keys in the river left a nice tide line for me at that peak that I was talking about earlier, that 2.4 meter peak. And I was able to see, this is what a 2.4 meter at the railroad bridge tide looks like at the new fishnet trap site. So that was, that was very nice. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to plan around it, and that makes life a lot that easier. That makes your job so much yeah. easier, I imagine. The silt isn't an issue right now either. That makes It's like this oh. year, it's a new site, and we can't, make direct comparisons to the old the old site mm -hmm. and, and we have lost something in that mm -hmm. but uh, oh it's so much easier working at this new site yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's, yeah. we're happy to hear that so what kind of species have you been encountering you mentioned the striped bass today yeah yeah we uh, have been catching striped bass we actually caught a salmon earlier this year though it was one that we uh, had released last fall Oh, and you know it's because you had tagged that salmon yeah, before you released it? it. Okay. Yeah, well, the funny thing with that, too, was actually before we put this, the tag reader on it, I thought to myself, this looks like one I've seen before. And it was one that... Even before you looked at the tag, yeah, you're like... But, well, I, we, I wasn't sure. And then we put the tag reader on it, and we saw that it was one, not only that we had released last fall, but we had actually caught it at the trap last <gasps> fall. What but about the fish looked familiar to you? Yeah, to really me, fish, fish is fish, and well, I don't think I would be able to that, that, identify that, that individuals. That was kind of my wife's reaction. She <laughs> thinks I've been spending too much time. Too much time, time. <laughs> yeah. We didn't catch that many fish at the trap last year as part of it. Salmon, I mean. Mm -hmm. We caught like two salmon at the trap last year. We've okay. only caught one so far this year. What was distinctive about it to me was its dorsal fin had part of it missing, and there was a, a sort of a scar oh. in front Oh, a scar of would be... And so both of, those looked, both of those looked kind of familiar to me. Now, when I look at the pictures uh, last fall, when it was, it was released as a fish that was ready to spawn, and so its coloration is different, the shape of its head is a little bit different. I look at it that then and look at it after it's overwintered, it becomes what's called a kelp. It's already spawned, it's skinnier, and uh, it's much more silvery rather than, you know, there's lots of differences. So okay. I, I look at the two pictures side by side and go, oh, it doesn't look that much alike. But yeah, like you say, the scar and yeah. the uh, notch out of the dorsal fin, that's what had made me suspicious that it yeah. might be the same one. And like, that's great. Poor fish, though, <laughs> to have the big scar we, on his back. We've also caught a couple of shad this season. Oh, American and, shad? Yeah. And that's that's an exciting one. That's a fish that was actually extirpated by the causeway. Yeah. Uh, and fairly did fairly rapidly within like a year or two of the causeway coming in, it was it was extirpated. And unlike salmon, where there's been a concerted effort to try and maintain the species in the river, yes. there hasn't been for shad. They're coming back gradually on their own, and that's that's kind of exciting. They tend to be a really skittish fish, and the, part of the mm. thought is is they probably don't like the control structure. Oh, that, uh, really? Because well, they have to basically swim through pipes to uh, to get up there. The first shad that we caught, like in 2011, in fact, looked like a fairly beat up fish. I wasn't sure if it had had a hard time going through uh -huh. all that. The ones this year look fine, but I guess my, my my thought is is that that's something that I would expect would be a difference once the uh, once the bridge is complete. You've got that open channel; they're mm -hmm. just free to come up. Yeah. That instead of getting, you know, we've been getting two or three uh, shad a year so we see some incidental movement but nothing nothing too profound other than the fact that they're there on their own which is kind of exciting yeah unlike the salmon cool. which we put in the river you so you've course. seen the atlantic salmon the american shad Stripes. and a few striped bass anything oh, else yes we've had tom cod that's oh, another species that that's a species that yeah, that's currently that's, i don't think it's a or wasn't it's it not, um, it's not listed or that was one of the populations was, that declined yes after it, the was, it was it was it was was extirpated. In fact, the first year that the trap was operated, they only caught one tomcod, and uh, our best year for tomcod has had over 3,000. So wow. 
That's quite a yeah. stark comparison. Yeah. One well, to first year the traps operated, there weren't any striped bass caught, mm -hmm. and uh, our best year for striped bass is over four thousand. So wow. we've seen some pretty nice, pretty nice results. Have you found any invasive fish species? Yes, three invasive fish species that we're dealing with on um, the Petacodiac. There's smallmouth bass, chain pickerel, and brown bullhead. Do you know how those three um, species were introduced? Well, I know with brown bullhead. It was introduced in the late 80s, Mechanic Lake up at the top of the Pollock River. Uh, someone put it in as a to generate bait fish for fishing. Mm. And then you don't, you don't find any record of it in the system before that, mm. and they're all over the place since then. There's anecdotal reports of someone having done that, so that all that all makes fish. sense. Yeah, that all makes sense for, for where they, how they got into the system. That said, you don't have to go very far; just over into the St. John, and they're native species so it wasn't okay. it wasn't like it was a big trip for like the exotic yeah. yeah somebody just brought it in nobody had a zebra fit lionfish lionfish <laughs> but uh the chain pickerel and smallmouth bass would have been introduced as sport fish unlike brown bullhead which doesn't really create any problems Other most fish of the native fish we're interested mm -hmm. in smallmouth bass and, bass and chain pickerel are definitely a problem for native species now do they eat the same food is that why they affect the other fish populations or do uh, they, eat the fish? they can they can compete with them but the real problems are that they actually with salmon in particular will, will eat salmon like uh, smallmouth bass will break up salmon reds and uh, actually eat the eggs or they'll get oh. they'll get the fries they're just coming out of mm -hmm. the uh, of the nests in June chain pickerel are actually capable of eating salmon smolt, much, much bigger fish. Salmon the, smolts, like, what are we talking the, about? Well, smolt would be maybe 15 to 20 centimeters long. That, that's the size they are when they're migrating out to sea, and, and chain pickerel will, can, can pick those guys off. Because they've got a really big mouth. Okay, I was going to say, it doesn't sound like a very big fish, but I've never seen a pickerel. Oh, fish. chain pickerel can, can be huge. Oh, jeez. Are you familiar with pike? Yeah. Yeah, chain yes, pickerel yes. are related to Oh, pies. geez. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Are there any projects in place to try and reduce these invasive species uh, populations? No. To really, help the, the Atlantic The salmon? only extent to which that's happening is, is that we have gotten permission in the last couple of years to... Port folly recovery specifically? Yes. Yes. It's not just us. We work together with the what's called the Petticodiac Fish Recovery Coalition, mm -hmm. of which PWA is a member and yeah. the Riverkeeper is a member and... There's lots of other community groups like Petticodiac Sports News Club, Moncton Fishing Game. They all come together. Mm -hmm. It's the Petticodiac uh, Fish Recovery Coalition that lobbied to get permission to actually kill the invasive species mm -hmm. that when we catch them at the trap. Like originally when we'd catch smallmouth oh, bass and chain pickerel, you throw them back. we would just say, have a good day and send them on their way. And that was kind of weird. But they're protected sports fish. And so our license didn't permit us to, uh, to do anything to them. Right. We don't actually have permission to uh, do anything about brown bullhead. But brown bullhead aren't really that If they're not affecting the population. Yeah, they aren't yeah. really that effective, that's fine. so it's not yeah. that, it's not not that a big a deal. Threat. So is that what you guys are doing this summer when you find these invasive fish yeah. species? You're with, tossing we, them out? We've only got one chain pickerel so far, and it was actually dead in the net, so we haven't uh -huh. had, to, had to kill it. But in 2015, we caught as many as 10. Now, that was before we had permission to dispose of them, okay. so they were also released. Oh. We had permission for 2016, 2017, and now this is the third year that we've had permission to do that. And where it's smallmouth bass, we've been, we've been euthanizing them since 2016. And what, um, do you use a chemical to euthanize these? Yeah, we have, uh, it's called clove oil. It's actually clove available. Oil. Yeah, it's just available across the counter from your pharmacy. Yeah. It's what you use for, uh, people use for sore teeth oh. and stuff. And we use that to anesthetize the fish, begin with just when we're doing uh, sampling. But what we do for the a higher dosage, is, yeah, we just give them a lethal overdose. Uh, okay. And how? What is a, a lethal overdose? Like how many milligrams? Oh, I wouldn't say it's. We measure it that well. You oh, just yeah. Put them in the bucket. And <laughs> okay. And, just kind of. Yeah. Like you really get the smell. smell. So we read in your bio on the Fort Folly Habitat Recovery website that salmon spawning is more addictive than tree planting. We were interested to hear more about that experience. Okay, well, anyone that knows me knows I really like trees. And mm -hmm. I mean, part of what I like about trees and planting trees is, is shaping habitat and actually rehabilitating and restoring In a restoration. Stuff. Yeah. Some of the salmon monitoring that we've done are what are called red surveys, which uh, after we do an adult release, we wait a couple of weeks and then we'll uh, go and canoe down the little uh, Nepal where we do our releases 
and look for evidence that they've actually built nests and spawned and left eggs that are going to overwinter and be, be producing the next generation the following spring. What kind of evidence are you looking for? Oh, you, you, can, see, the you, can, see the, you can see the nests in the gravel. They're not hard to spot. They're not hard to spot when you're on them. And one of the things that really struck us is, me in particular, is odd the first couple of years that we were doing this. We weren't actually doing it after an adult release. We were doing it looking for returning wild adults because we were aware of some that had been in the river. You'd go through all of this habitat that was, everything was in place for what you would need to mm -hmm. see it, and there were no reds. Like it's, textbook perfect yeah, habitat. Yeah, exactly. It felt kind of like when you watch a disaster movie and you see the survivors wandering through an empty city and like the tumbleweeds blowing by mm -hmm. and whatnot. That mm -hmm. here is all of this, everything should be here. In fact, you know, a few decades ago, there were reds right where you're looking, mm -hmm. but nothing. And then you do the adult releases several years later, and you do the same red surveys, and you're actually finding reds in these spots. So you get to see visible results, yeah. and that was what was so great well, to you? It's, I like building habitat, but empty habitat isn't interesting. Mm -hmm. no. Habitat with things living in it is something more engaging. I guess that's... Yeah, inspiring too. Yeah. Do you ever get like an emotional experience? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. That would be me. I, I mean, <laughs> those, the DFO figures was only about 200 Iboth salmon living in the Bay of Fundy. Yes. Living in the Bay of Fundy. I mean, we've had days where we put a couple of hundred adults in for spawning. Now, almost doubling the population. Almost doubling the population. Now, how long they'll live, that's an open question. But what their job to do is to actually spawn and produce. The fertilized eggs that are going to produce smolts in the future. So they've done their job. I mean, what we're really trying to do is the fertilized eggs in the river. Because, and see new generations. Yeah. The people have experimented with uh, releasing smolts into the river. And you find hatchery smolts. They're not very smart. They haven't got a lot of life experience and they just oh, get picked no. off. But wild exposed fish that have like gone through some natural selection and spent several years living and growing in the river, those those are the best rivers. So the earlier you can get salmon into the river in their life stage, mm -hmm. the better. And that's why we're doing adult releases. Because it's not actually, if you think about it, it's not actually the adults we're putting into the river. No. We're putting the next generation in even before they're, they've been conceived. And they definitely have a higher chance of survival when they're an adult versus a juvenile. Well, because you've got selective pressures have that have, been, yeah. have, have weeded out all of the ones that aren't well suited to that and they also have the life experience to uh, know what to do rather than just going and they see somebody thinking oh but he's going to feed me it's like no not necessarily no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, Fort Foley Habitat Recovery also monitors the Atlantic salmon in the Bay of Fundy by snorkeling do you are you involved in this monitoring at all or could you tell us more about I, that I've process? I've done a few snorkel surveys but really I tend to be so busy at the trap, the trap that I haven't... A snorkel survey requires quite a few people, and I can describe the process. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. That's why I've been drawn into it on occasion, but it's not something that I do regularly. The basics of the process are is that you'll have a couple of people who are starting a pie in the river, doing a defined section of the river, swimming down, and they'll actually have someone walking along the shore also as shore support, carrying supplies for them. And they're looking to see if there are any fish in the river and then making notes about what they're seeing. And we do those in particular prior to the adult releases because we want to see if there are any fish in the river before, before, you the, release, before them. We release them. Once we've released fish in the river, you have to assume pretty much that any fish you see are the ones that we've that just you've put there. Right. Unless you can capture them and you know, run the tag reader and, and figure out who they are. But, but if otherwise, it's hard to know. So you want, if you want to look for wild returning fish, which we do, we want to know what fish are coming back. You have to be looking before you do your adult release. Right. But yeah, so you get a team of people doing one section, another team that'll be doing another section below that, and a team below that's doing another section below that, because you want to do the entire river at one time in order to know what was in it on that day. So you guys have a time period in we which have you have do a, it. Have a time so period it's not a lapse over a couple, few days. No, right. it's a couple of people who are snorkeling through a defined section looking to see... That sounds uh, quite extensive and intensive. It is. In it, one day. it pulls together people from uh, Fundy National Park and DFO as well as Fort Fall. I mean, you get quite a few people wow. to do, and you do an entire river at once, and that's why we work collaboratively with each other 
on the different rivers that we're managing, like mm-hmm. the Park Rivers, the Upper Salmon River, and the Point Wolf. They'll do one of one river one day, one the next day, and then the Big Salmon River, which is DFO, will be doing that. With and we all three organizations will go and do that, and then help each other on Pollock and Little as well. Right, and the Big Salmon River. Where is that exactly? It's near St. Martin's, and that's a huge area for the Fort Folly Habitat yeah. Recovery. Yeah, that's too. that's actually uh, the river that most of the uh, salmon that DFO has in its live gene bank in Mactaquac are coming off of. Like Fort Folly mm-hmm. has actually been operating a smoke wheel at the mouth of the Big Salmon River for oh almost twenty years. Smoke wheel. Catch, catching the fish that, as they're coming down, and then they take them up there and they grow them and spawn them. And that's that's so, why the population hasn't gone extinct. Can you describe the benefits of the gene bank? They do genetic analysis of the fish, and they actually do planned cross planned crosses, and they basically are maintaining the uh, genetic diversity, trying to avoid domestication by bringing in wild exposed smolts for each generation. What they do is, is they take those smolts, they grow them to an adult size, they spawn them, and then uh, that produces fry that they release into the river to get wild exposed smolts to bring back. Because if they just kept them in the hatchery in a few generations, they'd be pure aquaculture fish. Uh, And that sort of defeats the entire point of the exercise. Yeah. For our last question on fish, I was wondering, so the tidal bore brings in the fish, do they actually like surf the tidal bore? Yep. Yeah. Really? Uh, in fact, th- I've got s- shown strong correlations p- with both eels and striped bass in terms of them coming up on the tide. Yeah. I, the st- I have a strong relationship with uh, the young of the year Gasparo, but it's, it's not that they're voluntarily riding it, it's that they're getting pushed back up into the, uh, right. back up into the nets. But, but do the uh, eels voluntarily ride the The eels are the voluntarily board? riding the tide. Now that's striped bass? bass? And yeah. I would say the striped I bass say. are too. In fact, I think that's may have been part of their original problem with the causeways. There, there was limited passage through the causeway, no tidal influence, and I think that the, the lack of tidal influence may have been an issue mm-hmm. for them because the causeway was right across a portion of the estuary and it just cut off the upper estuary from any kind of movement that way. Mm. Now you've That's also cool. been the head of several riparian restoration projects in the Petticodiac watershed. Can you describe to us what a riparian restoration is and what are the benefits of doing projects like that? Basically, a riparian re- restoration would depend, would be somewhat site specific, but it's hard to make generalizations. But that said, I'll make some generalizations. Okay. <laughs> what you're looking at is trying to stabilize, for example, a bank that may be eroding and putting silt into uh, the stream which if in particular it's doing that near some salmon reds, it could, there's a danger of smothering the eggs in those, in those nests so that they don't survive. So there's water quality issues you've got there. You're also looking at uh, establishing shade over the uh, river in order to keep the water temperatures low because salmon in particular and trout are, are cold water species. They, they like to have cool streams and if you have an open stream then you have you have issues with it being too warm, and that can create disease problems for fish and things like that. The stability is also an issue in terms of if it's along the side of a field, you can be keeping uh, nutrients from uh, running off. You know, if you've got a, a good strong riparian system, it'll it'll absorb a runoff so that it doesn't just go straight into the stream. It helps protect against flooding and things like that. There's there's a long long list of things you can come up with that you're attempting to achieve with a riparian mm-hmm. restoration. So there's many reasons to, to yeah. want to do a riparian restoration. But that's also a lot of difficulties to take into consideration. Yeah, well, p- particularly that. if an area needs to be rehabilitated, that already suggests that there's a problem there. Yes. And you have to kind of arrest that problem and help it help the site then heal and stabilize itself so that it can hold itself. Because you don't want to just have to be constantly putting inputs into it. You want what's what's a self-maintaining uh, repair. Right. Which, if you get plants well established and have them growing, that's what they'll do for you. Which is one yes. of the advantages of using plants to do some of these things over, say, building retaining walls and things like that. Because retaining walls, the material will, you know, break down over time if it's if it's metal or concrete, and then 
it doesn't actually repair itself. As it degrades, it becomes less and no, less effective. No, it expects you to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so do you have problems ever growing strong enough plants? Like we uh, planted some willows and we were really worried about really oh, yeah, high temperatures. And then the heat wave came and we're like, our poor willows are probably all dead. Hopefully yeah. not. What I do to work around that is I, I plant, like with the willows that I plant, I, I just plant live stakes. And I do that in either the uh, fall or in the spring. Now, we did some last fall, and we did have the problem that there was a big storm in January that came through, and it made a mess of the uh, site we did last fall. So we spent a good chunk of this spring rehabilitating the site that we had just rehabilitated. Oh, but uh, it looks pretty good right now. and it's, it's it's has Now it's had a good growing season to get healthy. I'm awesome. hoping that we won't that it won't have to weather a storm quite as bad as that last for last, a second year in a row. last last fall no. last winter though yeah. Right. How do you uh, measure the success of a restoration site? Well, I would say the big thing is whether or not the the plants you've planted, if you can come back several years later, if they're still alive, or if uh, you're stabilizing a bank slope whether or not that is in fact intact and stabilized or if, or if the problem that had been originally observed has just continued. So, I mean, the real question would be what was the goal at that site? And if you can if you can describe what the goal was and you look at it several years later, does it look like that goal has been achieved? That's how I would measure success in a general sense. Right. How do you select and prioritize the riparian zones or sites? Uh, Fort Folly has put together a stewardship plan. In fact, there's a process we go through where we do uh, what are called rapid stream assessments, rapid stream assessment protocol. We go through and we survey uh, the streams and establish a uh, database of what the uh, condition of the, of the river is. Okay. And we then do the analysis on that data, and we've got that into a GIS that lets us then look at what are the, what are the challenges in certain streams. We've done that for the Pollitt, for the Little, for the Anagans, for the North, right. and also for the Demoiselle. Yeah. And then once you've done that, you can identify where there are challenges. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, you then can approach landowners and talk to them and see if they're interested in dealing with these problems. So sort of figure out what right. your priorities are, and you talk to people and identify what their priorities mm -hmm. are, and you see where the two match up. And if they're willing and, it's, and we have the uh, capacity to do it, then what we do is we seek funding to uh, tackle some of these projects. And if we the get fun the funding, <laughs> yes, if we get the funding, then we uh, try and do the project. Yeah. Then after that, you have the monitoring and follow up to make sure that it's that it's actually working. And, mm -hmm. and for example, like with the one we did last fall, if it needs an intervention to help it because you had an unexpected extreme event that uh, did harm to it, yes. get in early and do what you can to uh, arrest mm -hmm. those problems and, and get them. Repair. Now, we understand that you hope to open a native plant nursery to offer repairing restoration services. Could you tell us about why it's beneficial to use native plants in a repairing restoration process? Well, the biggest advantage to native plants is that they're the best adapted to yeah. any given site that you're wanting to, to work on. They're the ones that, given the chance, would be there. Right. Another advantage to them is, is that you don't have to worry about unintended consequences. If, like if you were to use a non-native mm -hmm. species, it might be a very good species at binding soil and, and stabilizing a site and whatnot. But there are quite a few species I can think of that while they would do that for you, they would also then continue growing on and do things you didn't want. Whereas a native species, right. it's uh, been in the system for a long time and the, there are insects and other plants that are co-evolved with it that can compete with it. The insects may even help eat it and keep it in check, and it won't create new problems mm. because the goal is to fix a problem, not to not make create a new Yeah, it's not, to, not to create a new mess. Not to plant an invasive plant. Yeah. yeah. You're a published author as well, we've read, of Wildflowers of the Maritimes, the field guide that you photographed yourself. Uh, what sparked the idea of a field guide? Well, when I originally came to New Brunswick, I was having a hard time finding any good field guides. So initially I was kind of annoyed by that because yeah. as I've traveled around, I've kind of made a habit of collecting 
field guides. So I have lots of field guides to places I don't live anymore, but it makes a nice library <laughs> of, of plant books. Yeah, and that's great. I was used to having such things at my disposal, and there, there wasn't a good one. So I thought, well, you know, this is actually an opportunity to create one. Oh, so, uh, it's a very good make your own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's, that's sort of where it came from. Uh, what flower were you most surprised to find in the Maritimes? The flower that I was most surprised to find here was actually what's called cloudberry, or uh, might be fun. familiar with bake apples. It's that's another name for the same species. I, I had encountered that in Finland. It's a circumpolar species, and it's really yummy. So, so in, it's edible. Oh yeah, the fruit the fruit is edible and it's incredible. <laughs> Can you describe the taste to us? Yes, please. Other than sweet, it's, tangy. It's, it's it's very sweet. Okay, maybe a little tangy. Huh. Yeah. It looks like a raspberry, except it's amber color. You find it growing amber in bogs. Color. Yeah, you find it growing in bogs. In fact... So it, it needs kind of a wet environment yeah. then? Yeah. There's some in Sackville. There's some north of here. Okay. And then you can, in Moncton. You can find it try scattered one now. around here. Yeah! <laughs> they're, really, they're really good. And in my mind, I had sort of assumed it was a more northern species. You found fact, it in Finland. <laughs> yeah, well, in, it's common in Newfoundland and Labrador. In fact, actually, if you want to try it, you can go to Sobeys and you can buy cloudberry jam at Sobeys. Oh, right really? Yeah. I just have to do, I'm so do that. So that would be that would be the easiest. <laughs> That'd way be the to easiest way instead of going and trying to find yeah. them myself. But it it is just yeah, one, a wonderful. Fruit. Mm. The flower is it's it's an okay flower, but the fruit is what I'm passionate about, and and I would not have guess that it would be it would be here. Northern Ontario, yeah, sure, of course. Northern Alberta, yeah, sure, of course. But yeah. New Brunswick, that's that was kind of uh, surprising. Which flower is your favorite? My favorite would be what's called showy lady slipper. Oh, showy lady? Showy lady slipper. Showy lady slipper. It used to be the provincial emblem of Prince Edward Island, but they had a habit of using them to decorate the capital like cut flowers and it was getting to be rare and so they changed it to pink lady slipper instead because <gasps> oh my goodness it's, it's a beautiful flower though okay. yeah no and i guess part of part of the reason why i like it too is, is the, the one i got for the book there's it's quite a few expeditions i went on with family in order to uh, go and find the plants and like, botanizing and whatnot but that was a particular fun one so i have yeah. nice memories associated yeah. with yeah uh, it's the one we found for the book it's, it's actually in nova scotia it was a nice family album how long did it take you That's to collect awesome. all of the photos for this field guide? I started collecting them in 2010, and I had most of them by 2013, 2014. Yeah, so about three or four about three years. About three or four years. That's still a long time, I think. Yeah. That's like a whole degree, if you think about it. Yeah, if you think about it like that. <laughs> but uh, where the span, like it was all around the Maritimes, did you do this in your spare time, travel around? Yeah, well, when I first started with Fort Folly, I was seasonal also, so I right. had downtime. So like when I first put together the uh, pitch that I sent to the publishers, that was one winter, and I just had some downtime. Whoa. And then uh, when they got back to me and I had an agreement to try and produce a book, I was still seasonal at that point, so that was another winter that I had as downtime that I could take and, and do all that. So it was sort of in my off time, but it wasn't like I was trying to juggle that with work quite the same way as I might be otherwise. Now right. I'm actually on year-round Fort Folly, and I'm much more involved in report writing and all the proposal fun stuff. writing and other stuff. <laughs> You're a different and I, I, there, there's a level at which I do miss my downtime. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Because, like, I've talked to people and thought, oh yeah, we should do another, we should do a, one on woody plants and whatnot, that would be really good. And, and then you're thinking, when can I get the time to yeah, do that? Yeah, <laughs> challenge to find the opportunity yeah. to do that. Yeah, so. and then still have a life but, somewhere. But, but, but I, I also do like not being seasonal, so, mm. you know. There's pros and cons there's to both, cons. I imagine. Yeah. Of course, of course. So where yeah. does one purchase this book? Oh, it's available at Chapters. Oh yeah? Yeah, and, and you can also get it online at Amazon. Oh, uh, yeah, so you can get anything but, on it. Yeah, you can get everything on Amazon. <laughs> but, but off the shelf at Chapters is more convenient. Yeah. yeah. Well, well that's, that's all our questions yeah. we have for you today. Thank you so much for being on our podcast. Yes. No problem. For being a I'm good sport of all those out. questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real treat for us, so thanks very much.